again to talk aviation. Paul Brennan here in Wellington. And Martin Noakes, also in Wellington, for the time being. But you're going to be back over there saving Australia again soon. Well, saving's a strong word, but supporting and helping where I can. Trying to save them. Well, that's, yes, I don't know if that's possible. Dirty, sledging, ungrateful neighbours. Yeah, let's not go into the cricket, right? Let's just leave it. Have they sledged you in the workplace? No. No. (laughs) The, The amazing thing about when you work in Australia, the Aussies are unfailingly positive about New Zealand. They love the place. Oh. No, I, I don't think it's just New Zealand. It's just it's just what they do, isn't it? Yeah. We don't want to get caught no. up in that. We're not here to talk about It's best trans- forgotten as quickly relations. as possible, that cricket match. Okay, so, oh my golly, the last fortnight has been out of this world with a German Wings A320 crash. Well, it's more than a crash, isn't it? Suicide mission. Yes, the crash was a result of something else, yeah. Though we don't know the full facts yet, and um, there's been a lot of loose reporting and leaking and everything going on. And I, I tend to agree with uh, one of the airline pilots officials I think I heard interviewed the other day from the UK saying, you know, sort of slow down. We need to um, have some time and some clarity to do a proper investigation. He was very against the leaking of cockpit voice recording, so on and so forth. So a real story here of someone who shouldn't have been flying. Yes. Yes, hmm. really. And there's surprising thing about this as you say there's a lot of information came out really quickly normally it takes a couple of weeks for them to decode the recorders and, yep. and have a review board and get it all out there but this was sort of the, the well, cause it's, was leaked. The, it's being leaked yes well, although the French equivalent to the CAA did make a statement very early on whether they were preempting a leak or something but they were they said it's suicide then people leak the cockpit tape and all this nonsense. But, but surely that must be part of the job description is not to leak these mm. things. Mm. I'm just thinking from the point of view of flight crew, those conversations are supposed to be there to determine the cause of the crash. And they're not very happy about them being freely available because they can be played out of context. You might only hear one phrase out of dozens that are relevant. And, you know, the media, they have this sort of stuff as fodder. It's not necessarily treated or used in a way that is helpful. Yeah, that's, I guess that's my point. Yeah. But surely behavior that leads to that would show up in the cockpit on previous occasions. Well, it, it seems that the guy had been vetted a few times. Um, they obviously knew that he had crashed out of training due to stress and possible psychiatric issues. That didn't stop them from letting him complete his training mm. and start flying for um, German Wings or Lufthansa. Yeah. So it wasn't unknown. He wasn't hiding that. He appears to have been hiding subsequent episodes. And he, there's some talk now that he seemed to think he had problems with his sight, although the German accident investigator said as far as they could ascertain, there was nothing organically wrong with the pilot and certainly not with his sight, which is quite interesting. So maybe he thought he had sight problems and this was driving his um, psychiatric issues or it's all speculation at this point, we don't know. But the fact is he flew the plane into the ground and killed 150 people. Hmm. Mm. Well, you know, I guess these things can happen. That's probably about the only answer you can give at the moment. Uh, I wonder how German wings have uh, been performing in the last week or so. It must be difficult for the colleagues and other crew members and also the public uh, may have, uh, I guess it'll be a temporary loss of confidence. Lufthansa will be relieved that it's not a mechanical issue because they pride themselves in top-notch maintenance and operations and I think people prefer to fly them as a premium for that in that part of the world. So but, you know, it just surprises me with all this cockpit resource management and training and low-cost carrier. They're going to be flying very uh, intense sectors all the time. They're going to be, you know, with different people all the time. That This should show up. Mm. Yeah, crazy. It, it is going to be interesting to see what they do because there's just so many pilots required now. The number, they're, they're constantly cycling through their systems are incredible and I wonder what they're going to put in place to try and catch this stuff. Certainly there's going to be more robust re- medical reporting because this guy had been taken off flying by his personal doctor yeah. and he hadn't passed that information on. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of long and very hard questions asked about why that happened. Why wasn't the doctor notifying the airline? It should be an automatic process, shouldn't it? I mean, you've got a live um, uh, medical record running because the guy requires that for his job. If any additional subtraction is to be made to that, then it really should you know, flag up with the airline's 
doctor or whoever's head of uh, maintaining uh, oversight of the fitness of the pilots, it, it should like flash up on the screen like an app does almost. You'd think. Yeah, yeah. You'd, you'd think that there would be very robust reporting methods in place if a doctor feels someone's not fit to fly or fit to do their job, whatever that job might be. It's sort of like a no-brainer, hindsight, twenty-twenty vision, all that sort of stuff, that uh, if you can't get in from the outside... Even if there's a mechanical fault or some set of circumstance where it shuts behind both of you unwittingly or whatever, that uh, the consequences are catastrophic. I expect there's quite a lot of work going on around that right now as we speak. And, you know, there are a number of possibilities as to how you might do that. You, you, you might say we don't want a means of cockpit entry to be on the plane where it could be compromised. But you might have a satellite phone on the plane where... You can dial up a number. Dial up a number, get a code, and they remotely unlock the door. Yeah. Um, Who knows what they'll come up with. Probably something along those lines, I expect. Yeah. And also, um, the descent rate had me puzzled too. And I guess that'll uh, be determined by the flight data recorder. They'll be able to see how the uh, autopilot or the flight management computer was operated at that time. But why not just push the nose over and, you know, go down real steep? Yeah, and, and get it over quicker. Yeah, because he went down quite slowly. Quite Three and a half thousand feet yeah. per minute, which is the initial descent rate from that point. So, so yeah, maybe he just did that and checked out. I mean, you know, maybe he committed suicide before the plane hit. Popped a pill. Yeah, yeah who or, knows? Or went unconscious, yeah. yeah. Well, well, these are the things, I guess, uh, the point that was made that, that the reporting of this should be done carefully in the meantime because we don't mm. know these facts we don't know and these issues. Things. Although he must have been alive at least five minutes before the plane hit because you have to push the button to keep the door locked for, for there's a uh, when somebody requests entrance from the inside you either open the door or you push the relock the door and then, right. then it locks it automatically for five minutes until they push it again and again okay so, um, it doesn't explain also we had a few programs ago we mentioned that incident on air new zealand coming back from perth wasn't it on a triple seven and there'd been some sort of delay in the captain had got um, upset or something and locked the co-pilot out during the flight for, I think, only two minutes. Mm. And there was some talk of an alternative entry method, which was never explained. I hope the airline treated that very seriously. I'm sure they did. Um, And I wonder if that alternate entry method, there was some talk at the time that that had to do with getting access via the equipment bay, which is via an unsecured trap door in the forward part of the first class section, right behind the cockpit. Right, and you can what go under the bulkhead and then come up in the yeah, cockpit. Yeah, you, you roll up the carpet, open the door, and go into the equipment bay, and then yeah, come up in the cockpit. But I mean, if you're the That's captain cool. sitting there locking the guy out, and he comes up through the floor, you <laughs> must know you've sort of done something wrong here. Oh, yeah. It's not normal. I, I'm, I'm not sure how far that went, but yeah, but I, um, I, th- I think he got in back in, in through the door. But yeah, you'd hope so because that'd be quite alarming. Yeah, excuse me, the captain's not letting me back in. Just me roll up the carpet. I'm going under. Well, can you? Imagine Imagine what it was like for passengers on that German Wings plane with the captain banging on the door yeah. and then grabbing the axe and seeing it progressively get going from what's going on here to, oh my God, the ground's about to Some Something worth arrive. following up and that what somebody in one of the forums said that if the captain had managed to depressurize the plane that cockpit door would have unlocked as an emergency measure it would unlock the cockpit door ah. so if he'd managed to put that axe through a window of course presence of mind blah blah yeah, and, what do you and, do? and he might not have been they might have been below 12,000 feet because apparently that'll only happen if they're actually pressure highly you know at, yeah. at, at, at altitude well it's having the presence of mind at first you might think oh come on this is a bit of a bit of a joke yeah okay joke's yeah. over now already a minute or two's gone getting through that part of trying yes. to work out what's going on so yes. you're very quickly out of time huh so what has what has Lufthansa done in the um, aftermath of that? Well, they've cancelled a few German Wings flights on the twenty right. fourth and twenty fifth. Yeah, they've um, retired the flight numbers. They won't be yes, used I saw again. that. Yeah, yeah, and that's quite a common thing, isn't it? And Lufthansa's now brought in the two person rule. Yeah. Gosh. Okay. And then uh, we had another incident involving an A three twenty. We're only getting. Uh, these multiple Airbus incidents now because there are so many out there. Yeah, It used to be all Boeings, didn't it? All um, 7.2s or 7.3s crashing. And that's the Air Canada... Uh, well, it was a landing short. Crash landing is the yeah. better description. Yeah, it was very nearly just a crash. They they were very lucky. It ripped the gear off. Yeah, and ripped, the engines. Yeah, engines, gear, radome. Um, yeah, the, the plane is finished. And only 23 injured. Yeah, it's incredible that that thing held together. Um, I believe the weather was, I think it was described as atrocious. It was a blizzard, wasn't it? Yeah, heavy snow. 
But still, it doesn't answer why you'd land short. No. Touchdown 335 metres short of the runway, they think. Well, that's a, yeah, it's getting on for half a K. Yeah, I've, I've landed in Halifax yeah. in, in atrocious weather. He must have landed just ahead of the trees because it's, the airport is carved out of a forest. Right. And, I mean, another maybe 100 metres or so, he'd have landed in the trees. Which would have been? It would have been completely different. All over. Yeah. Um, I wonder if there was a fault with the aircraft. Maybe a, an engine problem or something like that. Because uh, you'd think it would be locked up to the ILS. Yeah, well, initial reports are saying there doesn't appear to have been anything wrong with the aircraft. Now, um, moving on from Airbus, onto the a Boeing product, the 787. Yes. A fine aircraft, which, oh, I've, yes. which I've flown in. Yeah, and you quite liked it. I really liked it. It was yeah. very nice indeed. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, Boeing had those early production models, which were non-spec. What do they call them? The terrible... Terrible teens. Teens, yeah. yes. Um, so that they're heavy and they're non-standard um, they production. The, yeah, they're heavier. They have non-standard structure. Yeah. They don't have the range, and they don't have the latest engines either, apparently. Oh, okay. But they will get the latest engines. There there will be a um, performance improvement package to bring them up to the latest standard. Um, Ethiopian's taken a whole bunch. Ah. So um, Ethiopian's a big 787 operator now. They would have got them very cheap, surely. Yes. They're uh, they're, they're talking of numbers under $100 million. Wow. Which is very cheap. And they don't necessarily need that maxed out range. They'll use them on sort of um, India to Ethiopia, stuff like this. So uh, apparently for them, no, they don't need the range, but they would like a common product for that type right. of route. Yeah. So, yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll take the hit and, and probably take the money from Boeing too. And I, I think they're basically one-for-one one replacements of 767s, yes. aren't they? Yes, yes. Mm. So that's good. Um, yeah, know, or they get them off the books. and a l- um, lot more parking around um, Everett now for... Other Boeing aircraft? Yeah, you know, they've been sitting there for a, a long been time. Sitting there for a long, long yeah, time. Like four or five years? Yeah, and the, and there's also some talk that they're probably not resellable. Right, so, so when, they'll be with them forever and then it's off to wherever. It just gets scrapped, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Talking of parked 787s, um, American Airlines ship three and four of their new fleet of 787s is going straight to the desert. Well, why is that? They can't get seats. Seats? Yeah, their um, French seat suppliers have been having a lot of industrial issues oh. and they just can't deliver seats fast enough. Okay, no seats, no passengers. No, so the, these brand new planes are going straight to the desert. and yeah, yeah, that'd be driving them nuts, wouldn't it? They'll be there from weeks to months. Okay, I wonder what you do in that situation. Who who pays? The seats. The seat manufacturer, I'm sure, is um, talking to their insurance as we speak. Yeah, yeah. And um, more 787 news. BA is is apparently, apparently only, experiencing above average niggles with oh. their fleet of 787s. Um, the other day, people reported one coming into landing at Heathrow with its um, ram air turbine extended. Yeah, now, what, what was Because that's non standard. It's non standard, and you don't test it in the air either, apparently. These new planes, you test them all on the ground if it's yeah. the same as the 777 one. No, um, you know, maybe it popped out, or maybe the pilot pushed the wrong button. But, um, yeah, yes. It's not normal. I read somewhere, some pilot saying that uh, there's no way it could be a test because if, if anyone asked him to run a test like that during a normal schedule flight he'd tell it to go and stick it where the sun don't shine yeah and apparently it screams like a banshee it's oh, right. really, that's how people notice it it's really loud uh, when it was coming in on the approach so there must have been a problem in the electrical system that, that, that they either had that out there for standby or really thought that there was going to be a power issue mm. well they didn't report a power issue so, so um, or it could have automatically deployed itself maybe there was a voltage drop or something so it popped out and this, and this seems to be the type of problem that BA is having um, electrical issues. They've also had problems with the slats. There was a plane stranded in India for a while with other problems. And brakes too, apparently. Yeah, brakes are electric an, uh, brakes. Electric brakes are an issue. So, so I think everyone's very happy with the plane, but it doesn't. It's, it seems that their their um, in service, you know, introduction to service problems aren't going away very quickly. Niggle, niggle, niggle. Yes, no one's. It's not dangerous. It's just you know a bit of a pain. Back uh, to uh, here, and we've talked uh, a lot over recent programs about uh, the gap being filled in provincial services uh, vacated by Eagle Air, the Air New Zealand subsidiary, and their Beach C-1900 fleet. It turns out that no one's getting an interline deal with Air New Zealand, which makes it sort of problematic for um, people coming out of those small centres, if, especially if they're going overseas or to another main centre going on through Air New Zealand to another main centre. Now, why would you think they would be withholding that well, service? Is it a technical issue or is it a business issue? What do you think? 
Yeah, I, I, I don't know. It certainly makes it very inconvenient, especially for departing passengers, um, pe- people going, uh, or domestic passengers, or and departing international. If you're Particularly. A, yeah, if you're an arriving international, you have to pick your luggage up anyway. So. Yeah. But yeah, it does seem to be a bit, perhaps a bit churlish. And you know, maybe there's some operational issue, issue that means if we don't have this type of agreement with an airline, we can't do an interline with them. I don't know, but, you know... I would have thought it's a PC, a scanner, and a printer, and you're away. Yes, but, but yeah, I hope it's not just being petty and, and not helping them out. Why would they do that? Um, Competition? Yeah, but they've withdrawn from there. <laughs> I know. Unless if, they're planning to come back in some But areas. If, you, if, if you've just given up your service to Fakatani and you're offering a perfectly good service from Tauranga, maybe you're saying, well, ah, you know what, what we'll make it difficult, they can drive. They've got to be careful because that could be seen as not supporting provincial New Zealand and, and that could, you know, damage the brand in some sort of way, potentially. Yes, I mean, they've got two choices. They could either fight it, which maybe is what they're doing, maybe, or they could support it and be seen as good corporate citizens helping the little battlers carve a niche. And also it's been obvious to anyone reading the papers in the weekend that Airbus are launching a a charm offensive or a marketing exercise to put the A400 out there. Uh, of course, recently at Avalon Air Show down there near Melbourne, only about a month or so ago. And uh, Ron Mark now, the uh, New Zealand first politician, also did a piece, I think a week or two ago, in one of the papers uh, raising the A400 along with the C390. <laughs> he even knew about that. What a coincidence. Yeah, what a coincidence. Um, as uh, tactical as opposed to uh, over-the-top strategic um, benefit for New Zealand. And then Cyclone Pam came along, mm. and, of course, we couldn't. We had trouble mm. getting those our aircraft up there, mm. both 7.5 and C-130. They both turned back, didn't they, on the first sortie? I don't know what causes a navigational error in both aircraft, because that's what was cited. Essentially, the first effort failed, and it wasn't much either. No. And this is again. Why would you? Why would you use a narrow body, converted package freighter yeah. for moving this sort of stuff? We've talked about that before, but it seems that um, the debate on what airlifted to get is heating up. I'm pleased to see that because I support the A400. I'm pleased to see that it's getting a bit of traction now. That politicians are starting to talk about it. It just worries me though that the C17 deal is more of a diplomatic, you know, sop. Sop than yeah. and then actually, uh, you know, something to fulfil a need. I, I don't know if um, you could fly the C seventeen up to some of those small islands in Vanuatu. No, and and I'm pretty sure if you took an incredibly complex analysis tool or Excel, <laughs> otherwise known as Excel, yeah, you'd work out quite quickly that um, while the C seventeen is a fantastic aircraft and and a feather in any air force's cap, it's an awful lot of aeroplane. Yeah. And let's face it, it's it's not a new aeroplane. People right. here might think it's new. The core of that plane is about 40 years old, actually. Well, the initial design, yeah. yeah. And, and they've been building them for, what, 22, 23? Exactly. Yeah. And uh, also um, the jets, so very uh, susceptible to FOD damage, even though the engines are up high. But, you know, in some of the places you operate, you've got stones and, and apparently dirt kicking around at that level. It's very, very... Um, uses a lot of fuel in the cruise. Yeah. Which, of course, because well, it's a high lift and all this. And yeah, it's not designed for long-range passenger they, they transport. They do say on the, uh, on the Iraq conveyor belt, you know, when, when they're going to and fro from Iraq... They suck eat, the gas. They huh? suck a lot of juice. You know, to get enough of them um, to be something in our own right rather than just, what, a, a sub-squadron of the Australian transport squadron? Yeah, and then all they do is be nasty to the crew. Yeah, sledge them they're all just the time. sledge them all the time. So I'm pleased to see that debate heat up. And... Uh, you know, I've got a feeling that the A400 might be the one in the end. Yes, but I think it, it carries the lavs, it carries the choppers. Yep, yep. Um, it's got the range, it's got the weight. Notice how they really emphasised in the advertising that it could make it to Antarctic and back on one tank of gas if the airfield is closed. Yeah. Because... <laughs> yeah, we've been there before. What happened last time? Yeah, it didn't work great. Uh, so uh, obviously they've, they've researched the debate here and they're pushing the buttons they think will get well the pu- it's got to be the public that mm. are lobbying here with that um, advertising i'm um, talking military aircraft you remember that incident that um the royal air force had with their a330 voyager tanker come um, transport aircraft it was about 2011 2012 i think 
it was an uncommanded um, oh yes yeah very similar to what's happened before with other aircraft that Qantas one yeah yeah and I think Malaysian also had an issue anyway an uncommanded yeah. divergence from the planned flight path and yeah quite uh, violent uh, very violent um, quite a few people injured some quite seriously when they hit the ceiling because they were oh, unsecured yeah, yeah and initially it was thought it was a software issue it turns out that it had nothing to do with software it was the captain's camera got tangled up in the controls oh really he'd been taking photographs on the uh, flight deck he was on his own and when he put his camera down it slid down the down the, the <laughs> within side stickers <laughs> yeah knocked the side stick with enough force or whatever that it disengaged everything and sent yeah. the plane and it was only the 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 flight envelope protection that actually saved the plane wow who would have thought that could happen? Yeah, yeah. It was an SLR with a big strap on it, and um, he put it down, turned around, and it all happened. Oh dear. Yeah. Okay, so it just shows you that anything can happen. Anything can happen. So uh, was it, did he not admit to that first? I don't. I, I, I don't know how the investigation went. He yeah. pro- he might well have. Yeah. But that's but, what happened. But he probably had, did, couldn't remember that because his camera is probably embedded in the ceiling at that point. He's, so well, so how the did that get there? The aircraft, yeah, yeah, hole in the ceiling, the shape of the camera. So the aircraft um, stopped well, over over descending and over banking, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, sort thank of, God sort for that. Itself out, yeah. Mm. It's pity that they don't recognise the guy's gone nuts. The software, you mean? Yeah, you should put on a tinfoil hat with electrodes every time you sit down. Before we get to the aircraft uh, of the day, uh, quite a big deal, uh, launch of this huge NASA balloon from Wanaka in the South Island uh, Thursday last week. So that would have been, uh, what, third week of uh, March. As big, I believe, when it's inflated as a sports stadium. And this is, what, to carry all sorts of uh, experiments and measurements for future space missions and all that sort of stuff. Mm. Uh, already, we're, we're speaking about a week after it set off, already... It's over chilly, is it? No, it's not over chilly. It's about three quarters of the way to chilly. That's impressive, though, isn't it? Yeah, it's currently. Um, there's live tracking. If you just go and look up NASA, yeah, high pressure balloon tracking, it'll take you to the map. It's at a hundred and ten thousand four hundred and twenty nine feet. Gosh. And it's trucking along right now at thirty nine point seven six knots. When I looked earlier this morning, it was at forty five knots. Gosh, just sort of a leisurely cruise, and it's kept an amazingly straight line. Yes, I'm looking at the tracking that you've got up on the screen. It's yeah, took off from Wanaka. A few little bumps, but essentially it's straight. Pretty much straight. It 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 looks like it's going to cross the coast of Chile about a third of the way up Chile. Yeah, and um, they they fully expect it to come back round, and they, they say it might oh. come back round a few times. And why do they let it go from from here? Is just stability of the yeah, weather or the it's, wind? It's, or? There's no land masses to mess up the wind, so uh. once you get it up there, it'll just it'll just keep on going. It was delayed a few times. Yeah, because it was too windy in Wanaka. Yeah, I think the the proof here is to see how long a high pressure balloon, because you know those balloons are normally sent up semi inflated, and they just go up and up and up until they burst, basically. Yeah. Well, this is structurally strong enough not to burst. Ah. So they've they've designed it so that it'll go up to 110,000 feet and sit there for as long as it can. Another um, thing that's happening at the moment, and that really becomes our aircraft of the day, something that's in progress, uh, I think, at the moment, isn't it? Yeah. And that is the um, Solar Impulse aircraft. This is a solar-powered aircraft, about the size, wingspan-wise anyway, I think more than a 747 gets along at quite a slow speed, but I think uh, the effort is to fly this aircraft around the world. It's a Swiss-based project. Yeah, it's the um, Picard, or whatever his name is, the same guy who went in the... Bertrand. Bath- yeah, his dad went to the deepest part of the ocean. Ah, that guy. And yeah. the, uh, the uh, Bathyscape. That was his father, and now the son, the psychiatrist. Gosh, a high-performing family. Yeah, yeah, well, well-sponsored family. Good on him. A zero-fuel airplane. Mm. That's uh, how they describe it. Solar-powered, um, with some battery capacity, so it can fly on when there's no direct sun. Um, to give you an indication of how slow it is, the, the first flight was um, 13 hours and one minute long and covered a distance of 441 kilometers at, at an average speed of 33.88 kilometers. But it did get up to 20,941 feet. That's a long way up. The next flight was 15 hours and 20 minutes long, but it covered 1,500 k's. Well, that's a lot more. Reaching a maximum altitude of 29,000 feet. 
and a um, average speed of ninety six kilometers an hour. It's not too bad. No, it it gets along. It gets along. And so it and depends on what the wind's doing. Really, yes. it has a lot to do with it. The first leg was from Abu Dhabi to Muscat. Then it went plenty of solar energy in that part of the world. Yeah, yeah. Then it went on to Ahmedabad in India. Yep. Then from Ahmedabad it went to Varanasi, also in India, and now it's crossed over. Um, it went Varanasi to Mandalay, and then it's going Mandalay to, which is in Burma, I believe, mm-hmm. Myanmar, and then after that it's going on to Chongqing in China. And they're trying out all sorts of technology. So they've got these sleep goggles that they put on that shine a yellow light into your eye that tries to match the system thinks your body's at. Puts you to sleep. And it, and, and it, sleep, it, it forces you into a deep sleep very quickly. Because normally, you, you know, you sleep, you yeah. have a light sleep, it plateaus, it goes up, it goes up. You, you go through phases, don't This you? just pumps you into 20 minutes of deep sleep. And they say when, when, when you wake up, it's, it's like you've slept. Wow. Well, you have slept, but it, like you slept really well. You feel like you've rejuvenated yourself. Yeah, yeah. I'm just looking again. You've got real-time tracking, like we were talking with the balloon here on the solarimpulse.com site and I'm looking at it now as we talk about it their battery power is at 31% at an altitude of 21,124 feet there you go there you go and there's battery pack for each engine hmm Um, I mean it it is a monstrous aircraft it's 22 meters long 22.4 meters long the wingspan is 71.9 meters so it's 236 feet wide yeah, it, it, yeah, it's got 17,248 photo cells on top of the wings, fuselage, and tailplane. So it's got 270 square meters of photovoltaic cells on it. Yeah. Um, bunch of batteries, 13 kilowatts worth of battery. Um, I would be petrified to fly in it. And if it's that light, uh, I mean... Well, you presume that the structure is up to it. They have to be, wouldn't well, it? Well, it must be. The loaded weight's 2.3 tonnes. Ah. But it's the size of a 7.4 in, in terms of what... I am just wondering how they're going to get from China to the States. It doesn't say they're not flying. Well, but presumably there's, there's an unlimited range if the sun's around. Yeah, but it's not. Not at 100 k's an hour going over the Pacific. No, you've it's, got night time. It's going to get dark at one stage. You'd have to have enough battery power or you, you'd, you'd have stop-off points along the way. You'd have to. Otherwise, you wouldn't do it, would you? Well, it's coming up soon because um, they're flying to China at the moment. Within China, they're going to go from Chongqing to, to Nanjing. Yeah. And then from Nanjing, they're apparently going to go to Hawaii. Why does China feature so much? Is it because it's they have the, to go through that way? Yeah, it's in the way. Or is there some deal going with them as well? No, it's Northern Hemisphere, so there's no right. way to avoid China. Okay. Yeah, and they've, they're sticking to those sort of mid-latitudes, well, relatively close to the equator where they've calculated as the most sunlight at this time of year. So our aircraft today is the Solar Impulse Solar Powered Aircraft, which is uh, currently uh, involved in a circumnavigation of the globe and ways to go yet. All right, until next time, Paul Brennan in Wellington and... Martin Oaks, also in Wellington. See you soon. Cheers.